I like rugby, but I'm not a good player at it. There are some interesting consequences of the rules I want to explore, and this is actually a famous piece of applied maths about a, a real-world sporting problem. And I'll explain some of the rules here, just for clarity. Uh, you can score points by putting the ball down over a line. It's called a try. <laughs> Very like in American football, a touchdown. The point about this, though, is that once you've scored a try in rugby, you then also get a chance to get some bonus points with what they call a conversion, where you kick over the posts. So full disclosure, in American football, you put the ball down over the, as a touchdown, you then get to take the kick from in front of the post. Is that right? I think that's right. Uh, yes. I've never played American football, but I'm reliably informed. In rugby, you cannot do that. You have to take the conversion kick somewhere in line with where you put the ball down. So if you put the ball down right at the edge of the pitch, like close to the, the touch line, which is quite common because people sort of bleeding you out there as you get tackled, you have to take a kick really close to the touchline, but you can choose how far back to take it. And that is our question. If you have the choice, which you do every time you score a try, how far back should you take the kick? If you are really close, if you, like, then you can imagine the post being at a weird angle, but if you go really far back, I mean, technically I think you could go to the other end of the pitch, but I don't think it would be clever for range reasons, um, even if you are a good cricket, unlike me. No, we can't! It's in! First time! The real issue is that maybe your advice should change. So let's get this one thing out of the way. If you put the try down under the posts, you have to take the kick in line with that. And there isn't really a problem here. You just go back far enough that you can get it over the bar, uh, and there's no worry, because the further back you go, the narrower the angle looks because you're further away. Obviously, if you try and take it from the try line itself, you're going to struggle to clear the thing. But this, this is the first modelling thing I want to get out of the way, is that let's just assume that under the post is not a problem. You take it close enough and you're fine. If you put a try down to the side of the posts, uh, and this is where I want to show you on the diagram. So here's a picture of a rugby pitch. Uh, I've got a nice 3D model. Uh, I think you might recognise the software. This is GeoGebra. So this point here is where I've scored the try, and you have to take a kick somewhere in line with that. And if I move this point, the line moves up. We just talked about going under the posts, no big deal. So if you're to the side of the post, you can imagine taking the kick from over here <laughs> looks a bit difficult if I sort of zoom the view around, like it's a terrible angle. But if you take the kick from really, really, really far away, it's arguable that maybe you've got a better angle, but the range starts to become an issue. And if you go really far away, like way down the other end of the pitch, the goal is just a really long way away. And even if the range isn't a problem, the angle is narrowing because you're getting further away from it. So the question I have here is how do you best get the angle of the posts to be maximised? Because that's going to be uh, what matters for your accuracy of the kick. There are some other things, like can you clear the crossbar? We've talked about that a bit. If you're too close, it's going to be tricky. Um, incidentally, there is, there's a five metre line on the rugby pitches uh, here. And I think a good rule of thumb is that at the, the angle most people kick at, about 30 degrees, they say, as long as you're at a distance to the other side of that line, you're likely to be able to clear the crossbar. So we can just dodge that part of the model. You're saying if you're closer than that, it's almost too steep. Yeah, you're like going to have to sort of do a proper chip, and actually that's really hard to give any power anyway, and it's just unnatural. Um, I looked up, apparently 30 degrees is roughly what a good kicker will kick at, and about 26 metres per second goes a long way. 30, you mean 30 degrees up, not yeah. 30 degrees ang. 30 degrees elevation, yeah. Elevation. Um, Everyone thinks that 45 degrees is the best, but it turns out if you, as a kicker, if you kick and aim to do 45 degrees, you lose a lot of power because it's not the way your, your leg moves. So this is the real modeling thing. You can look at the, the rugby players and they kick at about 30 degrees. And that also is going to solve a problem with range is that if they do that and they're professionals, they can kick a long way, like maybe beyond 30 meters, which means even if you went to the halfway line, there's still a chance that you could get it long enough if you could. <laughs> I'm aware that I should probably go and try this, but uh, I don't think I could do that. But that means the modelling is really how do you get the best angle? And the extremes are, I know you like thinking about extremes, if you're really close to the try line the angle is going to be really narrow, we saw on, the, on there, and if you're really far away it's also going to be narrow. Somewhere in the middle is an optimum, and that sounds like a task for maths. So that's our job. The first thing to do is to draw, to draw some diagrams. So I'm going to show on here a angle. Here is the angle, they call it the angle subtended. Um, most people have never heard that word unless they remember some circle theorem from school, but it's the angle that the posts make to your point here. And you can see that actually the measurement here, if I'm really close to the try location, the angle's down to three degrees. That's the super narrow angle. And if you're really far away, it goes down to single digits as well. But somewhere in the middle, I'm into double digits, 10.11 degrees angle. That's looking like a best place. But where is the best place? 
And does it change when you move your try location around? Yes. And I don't think it's obvious. So I, if you interview rugby players about where they do it, I am sure that they are solving this problem every day without doing a hefty amount of maths. But if you got down to it, and this is now big business in sport, getting those margins optimized, even if there's a place that you should take it from and then you adjust for your range and the wind distance and how tired you're feeling, it would be good knowledge. And I think we should solve it. Let me draw our rugby pitch. Those are, this is my idealized goalposts. And let's say we're working here and you score a try there. This is the line that you are allowed to take a kick from. And just to clarify, let's say you take the kick from here, then this angle is what we're trying to maximize. We could call it theta, let's call it theta. Really close in, the angle's gonna be tiny. Really far away, the angle gets smaller as well. There must be some optimal thing, how do we find it? Now, you could do this the long way. I recommend it as an exercise for any interested parties. You'd need some calculus because we're optimizing, we're maximizing something, and it gets super messy. So don't do it unless you're brave. There's a better way, and this is quite common in mathematics, is that sometimes you just need to draw a better picture. There's a few things you should know. This is the distance between the posts. Actually, I think it's 5.6 meters. If you change the rules of rugby though, we can still work with D. And the distance we score the try at, I'm gonna call X, and that's to the middle of the post. So it feels like a good place to measure where you score the try. So that's our variable X. And what we're trying to decide is this distance here, let's call it Y. How far should you pace back with the ball and exactly. take your kick? Yeah, so mathematically, we're trying to find a function uh, of X. So Y equals something to do with X. Practically, you said exactly the same thing, which is how far should you go back from where you put it down? Any three points that you put on paper or anywhere else, you can draw a circle through, a unique circle through three points. And there are three points we care about here, which is quite important. The left post, the right post, and your kick position that you may or may not choose. Wherever you choose, there is a circle that goes through those three. There's a, a thing that people learn in school about circles, a whole bunch of circle theorems. Circles have beautiful properties, and one of those properties is in play right here, because this circle crosses the blue dotted line there. That's why it went through there, but it also crosses here. And if I draw the other angle from there, We've got, uh, in the UK, a GCSE level circle theorem going on here. We've got a segment, um, or rather a chord across the circle, the segment's the other side of it, subtending an angle on the edge of the circle. And the theorem says that angles subtended off the same chord are the same. Now, this is nothing to do with where you've kicked from, but it's showing us that if you chose to kick from there, you would get the same result. Which means whatever distance you choose, there is another place where you get the same angle. Maybe this is not a surprise. Close in, it's going to be narrow. And really far away, it's going to be narrow. So you're seeing those pairings and the circle is backing us up. But here's another observation. So if the circle's really big, you're going to have a long, thin angle come out here and the angle's going to be small. If the circle is small, then the angle is going to be bigger. What we want to do is minimize this circle. And you might begin to see from this diagram how you could do that. It's easier to see if we make it move. So let me show you on, on the moving version here. Turn on the circle here. That's the same circle you can see that I drew. And you can see that it's drawn both angles that I've got. So let's make these angles even more separate. You can see if the angle's really small, the sort of pairing angle is further away. I mean, I don't want to drop the spoiler in here, but maybe Brady, you have an instinct about how to make that angle bigger. Like, what, what would you want to be true about these two angles for that to be as big as possible? Well, I feel like it should be the point where they're on top of each other, where the circle touches the line. Yeah, there. Yeah. Bingo. I mean, certainly, if you look at the numbers, we're at nine degrees there, it's going down that way, and it goes up back nine, and then it goes down again that way. There must be one angle that doesn't appear twice, or that's the same angle twice. It, and it's exactly what you said about touching, uh, technical math word, tangent, that where that line is a tangent to the circle is gonna be where the top two versions of the angle coincide, and we've got the biggest possible outcome. And that means we've got a really simple geometry problem to solve, uh, and that's it. So let's solve it. It's quite hard to actually draw this, because it's not obvious to me where the circle is that you said needs to just touch it, but it's gotta be sort of, just touching here, so eyeballing it, some, something like that. It's sort of touching, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's close enough for number four sketches. <laughs> but have I said this before on number four? Maths is the art of reasoning from bad drawings. So the angle here, the, the point that we're after is the angle where, is the point where both of these angles have coincided. This has got to be just touching, which also means we get a, another circle theorem kicking in, which is, means that the radius of the circle is at right angles to the tangent. Um, that's another circle theorem you learn, age 16 roughly in the UK. And there's one other fact which is now true that wasn't true before, which is that that distance x is now the radius of the circle, which means any other line from the center to the edge 
is also a radius and also x. So in particular, that line there is x. And if I draw one extra line, we, we mentioned before this, this center of the post is really kind of the center of everything. So if that's on here, you realize that this is a right angle triangle. And we know some things. We know this distance is d over two. In natural practice, it's 2.8 meters. This distance here is y, it's the sort of parallel version here, and we know that part of the triangle is now x. And that's crucial, because we've got a right angle triangle, we know all three sides, Pythagoras is waiting for us. I'm just gonna write down Pythagoras' theorem on this triangle. We've got x squared equals y squared plus d over two squared. And we kind of want it the other way around, we want y in terms of x, so that you put the try down, you know x, how far do you go with y, you get y equals, I'm doing it in one step, and the viewers may be horrified, I'm going to take the, the, this one over and square root everything. So it's the square root of x squared minus d over 2 squared. That is the formula which every rugby player, when they score a try, does not use. Just to be clear here, so the distance I walk back to take my kick is where I scored the try yep, from it. the centre line yep. squared minus half the width of the goals squared, yeah. all square rooted. Yeah. Oh, right. I think that's quite tough to do in your head, <laughs> even if you memorize the width of the goals. And I'm, I am really keen to point out before anyone's like, just knocks me down for being stupid, is that nobody would ever really want to do that calculation. So the art of modeling things is to get some sort of rule of thumb, which is maybe a good way to get that calculation done approximately. And I think approximately is all we're after here. The reason they don't use it, and this is something which I haven't heard talked about lots, although I'm sure people have noticed it, is that there's a much quicker way to get very close to that answer. The art of modeling things is to get some sort of rule of thumb, which is maybe a good way to get that calculation done approximately. And I think approximately is all we're after here, because there's gonna be wind, and I'm gonna be tired when kicking the ball, everything's gonna change. The spin of the ball in the air, all sorts of things are gonna change it, but we've got a starting point. But let's have a quick look at what it looks like if I plot it. So on my diagram here, I've got show locus of best spot, by which I mean, as I move the try location around, the best spot location, which I'm gonna turn on as well. So the best spot you can see actually, let's just move it around so you can see your earlier instincts were pretty good. That was our kick spot. The blue one is marking the best spot. So, and you can see the red circle is the one that we sketched just now, it's the tangent circle. But if I show you how that point moves, as you drag the try location around. Unsurprisingly, it's getting closer to the goal as you get close, but then something funky happens there that's hard to tell. So let's just trace this point, uh, which is this. The yellow line is the locus of the best points. It is not a straight line, it has a funky curve here. In fact, this is a hyperbola. It's a rectangular hyperbola. Uh, it looks straight from here. It is kind of straight. If I, if I spin this round, or maybe view from the top, you can see if I zoom out, that it has this, this curve as you get close. But then it does look like it's pretty straight, and there's a reason for that, because a hyperbola has an asymptote. Um, you probably recognize a hyperbola, and I'm sure you don't need me to point it out, but let's point it out anyway. The graph of 1 over x looks like this. In fact, there's another one down here. It's that sort of shape we're after. It has asymptotes going on here. In fact, the one we're looking at is a little bit more like it's um, heading off in that direction is if that's the center of the of the uh, posts. But the the point is that hyperbola has an asymptote and it is a straight line as you go in the long distance. And here's the catch. If you look back at the formula, if x is big here, then as you increase x, this d never increases. And so you could maybe arrange it for x to be super big and it would just dominate this thing. And basically it's irrelevant. And if you cover that up, you've got y equals the square root of x squared, otherwise known as y equals x, which is, 45 degree line, which means if I go back to my diagram and sketch the 45 degree line, it's pretty much that line. In fact, if I show the rule of thumb, which is me just plotting a 45 degree line on here, this red line running down here is pretty much exactly the same. In fact, it's overlapping for most of the pitch. The only place where it doesn't overlap and the curve kicks in is really close to the goal. And my advice is you're too close to the goal anyway at that point. So here's the rule of thumb. And I don't actually know if rugby players are thinking this, but 45 degrees from the center of the goalposts, which means pacing, which is what you said earlier, is dead simple. If you paced out 10 paces, where well, you put the try down, pace out 10 paces. There's a few catches though, because modeling is, this is assuming uh, all sorts of things like that you can kick it far enough, 
And I think if you start to get into the realms of like asking me to kick it, then maybe my actual range would start to mean that how, if, even if that's the best angle, it'd be much better for me to be closer because I'm rubbish. Uh, what's the wind doing? And there's a big kicker, which we haven't pulled in, and I'm not going to do it, but we're in a three-dimensional world, and we've been doing it as if we're just looking down flat. And actually, the angle we want to measure to the posts is not flat along the ground. It's up a bit. Because the crossbar. Because the crossbar. You've got to clear the crossbar as well. And I think that would change the analysis. I think it doesn't, doesn't change the outcome very much, but this is what modelling does. You start to include, include the complexities. Life gets a lot harder, and you maybe only make a tiny incremental gain in advice. And I think at this point, the inaccuracies out on a pitch when you're tired and the wind's blowing means that a 45 degree rule of thumb is a pretty good way forward. And uh, that's what I'm going to do every time I play badly rugby from now on. Why not brush up on all things angle related with this trigonometry course from Brilliant? I feel like I shouldn't admit this, but I can't really remember how sine and cosine and tan work. Never mind, Brilliant has me covered. And their courses are so interactive, you can see what I mean here. Love this stuff. Brilliant's just bursting with courses, lessons and questions to get your brain buzzing, and they're adding more stuff all the time. They cover all manner of complexity and ability. Whatever you want, you're going to find it. And if you're already using it, why not give Brilliant as a gift to that learner in your life? There's a 20% discount when you sign up with our URL, brilliant.org slash number file. That's down in the description. And they also have a 30-day trial, so you can give it a test run. See what you think. I've met numerous people who work at Brilliant, and they're all so passionate about these creations, about making people smarter. And I also appreciate them sponsoring this number file video. And so as I just discussed, this should be more than twice this. And so now we can compute the, the cross ratio for these four points and for these four points, and I should get the same answer. So that's as quick as it can happen. So if, say if now there's a red card, we could research a fact about that red card, say it might be the player's eighth red card, only two players have got more. 